Hi, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome back to the session 3.2 for today. Uh, so uh, in this session, we have three presenters. Uh, they are uh, Hee Suk Lee, uh, Nin Nyo Cha. Uh, I'm sorry if I have a, a not really good uh, pronunciation. And uh, the other one is Tian Tian Ang. And uh, the last one for this session is Nishamon Hiranyapuk. Okay. So before we start uh, the presentation of uh, He Suk Lee, may I also remind uh, the, our audience who are uh, being with us at this webinar and also watching us uh, from live uh, from our Facebook Live that uh, if you have any questions, please use the uh, Q&A box for questions only. Uh, the questions in chat will not uh, be considered. And uh, for the one who are watching us uh, through our Facebook, you can post the question and our colleagues will take it uh, to the presenter. Uh, and uh, just uh, for your information, every day we will randomly select two questions from the audience to win a prize, which is our SPAFA bag. I'm sorry that I don't have a chance to show you the bag, but uh, I can promise it will be excellent. And uh, conference proceedings will be released online on Friday. Uh, so uh, come back to our uh, paper. Uh, he Suk Lee is the uh, independent scholar based in Helsinki, Finland. She will give a presentation on tangibility, intangibility on UNESCO World Heritage Baroque Philippine Churches, the spirit of place and its collective memory. Uh, he Suk Lee, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. I'm not sure I will try to share my screen. If it doesn't work, but it doesn't move, then I need your help. Okay? Okay. Maybe uh, uh, it seems like uh, it seems like uh, share screen. Uh, does it work? Mm -hmm. yes. Does it move? Yeah. Does it move? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Has it moved? Okay. It, it can move when I started. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me see. That, uh, yeah. Okay. I have to close because the internet is not so good here. Okay. The Port Turkish Manila Santa Maria Pao y Miyagao, built in the Spanish period of the Philippines, 16th to 18th century, exemplified the, the interpretations of the European Baroque style by Chinese and Philippine artisans, symbolizing the fusion of the West with the local materials and motifs. They have formed an innovative sacred building tradition. Characteristics of these churches are monumental and massive to protect against the intruders or natural harms. Moreover, the iconographic decorative facade of the Miyagao church underlies the regional understanding of Christianity and Saint Petron among contemporary Catholics. Christians arise on the syncretic Baroque sacred buildings relate to the, their spiritual place and collective memories among current church goers, inhabitants, and visitors in the Philippines. The 2003 UNESCO Convention stipulates the interdependence between intangible and tangible cultural heritage and avoids its role as a cultural diversity and a driver of sustainable development. Two expressions define intangible cultural heritage because the collective memory belongs to intangible cultural heritage. Uh, traditional, inclusive, representative, and community who produces, sustains, and transmits it. Do you have uh, this next slide there? Can you see my next slide? Okay, as intangibility, uh, can you see my slide? Uh, the term collective memory coined by Albash is a foundational framework for studying societal remembrance. It suggests a possibility of construction, sharing, and passing on by communities. Architecture is a reference for binding people to past the generations and influencing their memory. Every collective memory relies on specific groups described by space and time. The group constructs the memory while the individuals do the work of remembering. 
or tangibly place his spirit for providing identity presence and actions, and the spirit of place bears the atmospheric duality of a landscape. When this duality identifies the spirit of place, it creates human shared or individual perceptions of a specific landscape. Place identity can be shared like on through experience, memories, and people's activity. Therefore, this paper discusses the tangibility and intangibility of Baroque Philippine churches through the, the spirit of place and collective memories and reinterpreting their continuing existence. I'm not sure you can see my uh, next slide. Yes. Uh, so, I, oh, <laughs> uh, I have to talk a little bit history. The Philippines is named after King Philip II of Spain, becoming a Spanish colony for over 300 years. From the 10th century, Filipinos traded with China, and by the 12th century, Arab merchants reached the Philippines and they introduced the Islam. In 1521, Ferdinand Magellan landed here and claimed from for Spain. Magellan baptized a chief Kumabon, making as a proper ruler of the Spanish crown. One chief Rapraf refused. At the fight, Magellan was killed. The Spaniards did not gain a foothold in the Philippines until 1565 when Miguel uh, Lopez de uh, led an expedition which built a fort in Cebu. In 1571, they built the city of Intramuros, later called Manila, becoming the capital. Creating a border system, Spaniards owned the vast estates worked by Filipinos. Along with the conquistadors, Friars converted the Philippines to Catholicism and built schools and universities. The Spanish colony brought the prosperity. The Chinese exported the good silk for slave labor through the Silk Road to the Philippines and the rigs port to Mexico. In 1762, the British kept the Manila for two years. They handed it back due to the Treaty of Paris signed in 1763. So this, I'm going to talk about the four churches, but uh, what is uh, most important, as I mentioned to you, that it was inscribed the uh, four church. There are many, many churches, but four church UNESCO World Heritage. So we have uh, 10 criteria, and one to 60 is a cultural heritage, seven to 10 is a natural uh, heritage. So here, criteria second, the group of churches established a style of building and design that was updated to the physical conditions in the Philippines, which had an important influence on later church architects in the region. And the criteria in force, the Baroque churches of the Philippines represent the fusion of European church design and construction using local materials and decorative motifs to form a new church building tradition. As I don't have enough time, I will jump and you can read the uh, proceedings. So here you can see here Paoya Up Park in Santa Maria and the Manila and the uh, Miyagao in the Iloilo. And I'm going to talk uh, very, very briefly about uh, these churches. So the first is the Church of uh, San Agustin of Hawaii, Ilocos Norte, received recognition for its 24 coral block addresses and ornate stone finials. Despite its construction began in 1604 and was finished in 1710, its coral stone bell tower distancing from the church was already in the second half of the 18th century. The bell tower intended to serve next to the main building to prevent its collapse on the church during earthquake. Separating bell tower is a characteristic of a Philippine Hispanic architecture to protect the structure from calamities identified as earthquake baroque. The power church exemplifies it. The second is the erection of Santa Luisa Senora de la Asuncion in Santa Maria Ilocos Sur in 1765 demonstrates a monumental brick facade and a reinforced world against earthquakes. Its uh, appearance evokes a hill town in the Mediterranean and is the only example in the Philippines. The church's features contain an 85-step stairway that leads to a carving the Virgin Mary atop a tray 
free and on original bell tower. Uh, the primacy and simplicity of its geometry forms in the site land an outstanding example of a peripheral Baroque architecture. This is a, a brick building, and brick building actually in Spain we call Mudehar, Mudehar, which is Islamic people, uh, Muslims made for the uh, Christian um, um, time, and then they moved to Mexico, and from Mexico come to here, to Philippines, or directly from Spain to here, Philippines. And the San Augustine Church in Manila and Intramuros, Manila, served the Christianizing the northern part of the archipelago. Its characteristic are the stone barrel bolt, dome, and the arch the vestibule, the Baroque altar, choir stores, and the ceiling paintings. Erected between 1587 and 1606, it is the longest standing in the old church in the Philippines. Earlier, the Church of the Immaculate Conception of St. Augustine was built on the site of the Augustinian Order in 1571, soon after the Spanish conquest of Manila. In 1587, the wood palm front building was replaced by a stone church and monastery, becoming the oldest mother house in the country. One building within a monastery complex survived its destruction in 1945. So my main interest is this uh, church, Hawaii. Miyagao became an independent part in 1731 on the erection of a simple church and a monastery, Muslim village of 1741 and 1754. Destruction forced the new building on the highest site to withstand the further incursions. However, damage took place by fire during the revolution of Spain in 1898 and the Second World War. Of the two bell towers ordered in 1854, demolition of the northern uh, in the 1880 earthquake took place. Accordingly, the threat of natural disasters favored the durability and functionality of the church building instead of its aesthetic consideration. So I will come to you this aesthetic uh, this, uh, regards. Church of San, uh, Santa Thomas de Villana Nueva in Miyagao, Loilo, witnessed the country's history during the Spanish period and the foreign forces and preserves the fortress Baroque style, which material is a local sandstone. As this paper deals with the spirit of place and collecting memos among Catholic most local believers outside the visitors on encountering the sacred building, the Miyagao Church's facade can witness in its indigenous and the European uh, ideas and forms based on the author view and the specialization on syncretic ornamentation. Uh, the glimpse of a fortress structure you can see here, and the towers and those Miyagao is a scrimmage, but the facade ornamentation generate the church distinct, recollecting an altar, uh, a niche above the front portal house, Santo Tomas de Glano, which you can see here in Santo Tom, this uh, Thomas, uh, uh, an Augustinian monastic scholar who became the Archbishop of Valencia, Spain. His asceticism preaches and charity for less privileged people brought him a reputation. In a piece of regalia, with his right hand, he clutched a bag of coins and child explicants in front of him, which you can see in the middle part. Uh, the two other niches, which you can see down part here and here, uh, planting the main door of the San Henry of Bavari and Popius VI. Because San Henry Bavari, he was a holy empire, in the, and he was a patron saint of churches. That's why he was here and the Pope Pius, uh, probably he was Pope when the church was built. But from the Nietzsche, uh, from the Nietzsche, you can see here middle, a band of dentists and rosettes put a blind baluster runs horizontally. The facade optimizes the local transfiguration of Western decorative elements, such as the coconut tree, which you can see here upper, and the fruit of Latin papaya trees and the figure of St. Christopher, who fed the people across the river. He carried the Christ child on his back, grasping onto a coconut palm for support instead of a traditional stuff. 
The additions depicted St. Christopher wearing a local dress with his pant legs rolled up above the knee. The juxtaposition of the folk ornament and the Baroque design in acculturation between the indigenous tradition and the contemporary European style. So what I want to say to you is uh, this, uh, why um, uh, my paper is, uh, uh, and you can see here in Alta, uh, like the passage, all the same as in Alta. So what I want to talk about is a uh, folk theories can illuminate the public discussions of the Miao passage ornamentation. First, the cultural heritage, second, the spirit of place, so, so this collective memories and the post ornamentation. So I'm just going to read only one part. Uh, tangible physical artifacts include the built heritage and other tangible product of human creative building cultural significance in society. In tangible heritage designates the practice of it, representations, expressions, knowledge, object, and cultural space uh, transport and the request through generations to put forward a sense of identity and continuity. So the respect for cultural diversity and human creativity. So tangible world heritage, we have a six criteria which I mentioned, and in tangible cultural heritage, we have four main things. And particularly about the spirit of place, this is very, very important because every place has a spirit and a sense of feeling. So people invent a place out of space by naming it and doing meaning and the blending events and the attitude into a whole. The spirit of a place evokes a sense of belonging and well-being due to its meaning and emotional connotations. It builds atmospheric quality which generates a sense of place. Identifying this quality with the spirit of a place creates people's individual shared perceptions of a specific landscape. The sense of place consists of a four emotional, cognitive, or behavioral, social element. First, place attachment means the emotional element connects to an environment. Second, the place identity. The cognitive element contains the individual's values, attitudes, and beliefs about their surroundings, affirming one's identity. Third, so place dependence, the behavioral element refers to a functional reliance on an environment in offering goal achievement, force, social bonding, a social element that proposes an environment to become meaningful through social relationship and shared experiences. Place identity can be enhanced through people's experience, memories, and activities. Its structure is drawn up through reflections of these social structures. And the, the third element is collective memory. The English phrase collective memory emerged in the second half of the 19th century as a sociological and the social Durkin. Albash coined the term as a foundational framework for studying social remembrance. He analyzed the notion of collective memory in the Garden Social de la Memoir, 1925, states of possibility of construction, sharing, and passion on by any side social groups, communities, nations, and generations. All of the individual memories are recorded through the filter of their collective and social memories built within social structures and institutions. I have a little more uh, about this one on my proceeding, so uh, I will jump in. And most of the last part is ornamentation. This is very important because uh, normally when we see the medieval uh, these churches in Europe, they have very much ornamentation. But how, but however, in here, we don't have enough ornamentation in Philippines. That's why I want to emphasize ornamentation. So the Renaissance architecture historian Leo Battista Alberti proclaimed that uh, ornamentation conveys the authority of God and persuades the believers' emotions toward God through its splendor. The 19th century moral critic John Ruskin expressed that ornamentation is God's pleasure, praising faithful Gothic artisans despite their less quiet in around the sacred building. In his book, The Seven Lamps of Architecture, 1849, Ruskin questioned whether the cover was happy during his stonework because thoughtful and happy artisans made the Gothic 
uh, coming to be novel. So here I have a more bit more text, but uh, uh, coming uh, I, I want to continue. So why I, I want to show this one? This is Europe. Uh, this is Romanesque time, but the particular Romanesque time we had a very much decoration, ornamentation on the portals or facade or everywhere. However, Sisterson, uh, Sisterson, uh, they do not want to have so much this ornamentation on the everywhere because this ornamentation uh, um, make the has a obstacle for the concentration uh, to God and the nearing God. So the Abbe Fontenay, France, this is UNESCO, the Roman system, you can see the very, very simplicity. Through so simplicity, uh, they uh, approach to God and they can meditate uh, much better. So my conclusion is uh, all discussions so far raise a notion of cult as a whole. Why so? According to the famous anthropologist Cliff Griffiths, culture consists of behavioral explicit implicit patterns forming the distinct achievement of human groups acquired and transmitted by symbols. It builds traditional ideas and their occasional values. Culture systems may be production of action or conditioning influence upon further action. As a visual language, it embodies the landscape and mount uh, monuments. As a cultural asset, a church is a symbolic place and an ever lasting manifestation of the divine project as a part of the universe. Believers entering the sanctuary perceive a harmony of a world governed by God and the eternal life that awaits them. Collective memories cooperate with a place possessed by the spirit which endows identity to the place. Intangibility and tangibility interdependent even much. This is my last uh, uh, slide. So returning to the world heritage, which is the Philippine Baroque churches, a commonality among the four churches is the construction against the earth case, while its difference is the level of applying ornamentation. Moreover, compared with the Orthodox Baroque churches in Europe, they are less grandeur, elegant, refined, and luxurious. Above all, I can argue that originalism, acculturation, and syncretism across time and space contribute to the Baroque churches in the Philippines in terms of cultural heritage, the spirit of place, collective memory, and ornamentation. Accordingly, anyone standing in front of a sacred building has received God's hospitality and will be. It is a charm of a culture, and the four churches in the Philippines have known this gift. So finally, the rationalism looks for some sustaining spiritual forces and they refuse to accept that a tradition is a fixed set of devices and images. The aim is to unravel the layers to see how indigenous archetypes have been transformed by invading forms uh, and in turn to see how foreign imports have been adapted to the cultural soil. Beyond the particular, the rationalist tries to see the type, the general law, the original principle, uh, principle. So I just show you the under, you can see three mosques. If you see Indonesia, normally mosques we have gone, but Indonesia, they use the typical vernacular roof. Same time, they use this Hindu Buddhist concept is a mountain, Meru, Cosmos mountain, and the using see this concept in Islamic way. So rationalism is very important and the collective memory and all these other uh, spirit places are very, very important to, to interpret architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so for the Q&A, uh, for you will be at the end of uh, the session uh, after the, uh, the, the third presentation. Um, shall we move to the next presentation? Uh, Paper. It is the uh, Mayingaba village uh, began the resilience of traditional knowledge and culture, which will be presented by Tian Chen Ang. Uh, Tian Chen Ang uh, did a master degree in archaeology at uh, Yadanambon University in 2016 and master of research in 2017. Uh, and then uh, he did a postgraduate diploma in Asian art in 2019 at SOAS, University, University of London. Uh, shall we start uh, the presentation for Tian Tian Ang, please?
Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation. My name is Ding Ding Er. Today I'd like to talk to you about Mingawa village Began, that resilient or traditional knowledge and culture. Mingawa is one of few Asian cities known as Anuradha. Mingawa is quite distant area with its poor location and ecology on the Yawadi River. Mingawa has ancient production evidence such as Severin Glaze King, with bees traded along the river from the past millennia century. The ancient bees are found in Mingawa near Kansai and the brick with Pupinga, Makar, were found in Pangu and Jaumia Moor at Mingawa. It suggests Mingawa may be one of the earliest bullish or bacon. Moreover, Raja Kumar inscription Mingawa Gubiaoji, Manuha, Nampiyar, and Apayadana temples were built in Mingawa. As you can see on this map, 19 villages are pure Asian cities in Bagan. Here, Anuradha, now Mingawa village, There is a natural in Mingawa. Some spirit net believers from Mingawa came to pay respect to a missionary, especially on the ceremony or novitiation. Local people often came to pay respect to her for sharing the mirrors with them. It is located north of Mingawa stream. This is Manuha Tambo. There is a huge Buddha statue in the shrine in Boba Meadow, the shrine, Shui Pinji, Shui Pin Lei, and Duradati Meadow shrine is also located in the Manuha compound. Here, they are the figure or donor of Manuha Temple, Manuha kings and his wife. Moving on to the next point, Mingawa became one of the major parts for trading bamboo from upper part of Burma to Bagan, Mingawa. The port also stayed active for villagers coming to work from the West Bank or Eowadi River to Bagan. And there is also a lake in G near port. The sands from Inji is a kind of the process or soil with high clay. It can be used in making the brick. Take a look at this map, the location of Asian seven kings in Mingaba village. Interestingly, the Asian color bees were found near Kinside. I took the picture of bees from a collector and Mingawa. These Asian color bees can be found near King's and Shui Umi Monastery, southwest of Mingawa village. Now, let's move on to the next point. Mingawa livelihoods or local people are production of traditional handicraft, arts, and cultivation. Lacquerware and bamboo craft are the main business of Mingawa communities. I did an interview to the Mingawa native bamboo distributor who is Umya Ma on his 80 years experience with bamboo. He said, the source of Mingawa bamboo is from Bamo, Galewar, Homelin, and that is being shipped along Chindrin and Eowati rivers, Mingawa has become a bamboo market and bamboo products have been distributed to other villages. Bamboo strip making is being used for household items such as house roof selling the creation with traditional patterns, bamboo craft and mat and enclosure sheets by the old customary way. 
Around 25 households engage in bamboo strip making with income from save or household items. And another interesting is the lush paper puppets are made from bamboo frame for performing in the Pagoda Festival. Bamboo makers are talented and continuously innovate the puppets with excellent scale. Neighboring village visit to see talent or make of a bamboo craft maker for puppets during the festival days. They are confident in their living with great respect for their heritage. In addition, sometimes making bamboo map and enclosure sheets for domestic house can seem boring work for the young generation of bamboo production. However, the young people are looking for tourist markets and hotel decoration as a new strategy to innovate design and shape using traditional ways. They produce creative household items such as bamboo lamps, the basket, hat, cup, chairs, and foam stand, and so on. Another is in historical times. The practice of liquor are possibly being started since the Bacon period. It seemed that the liquor cell was used for Buddha statue in ancient time. The earliest example of liquor Buddha statue with a date or twenty and thirteenth century is displayed in the British Museum and the Cleveland Museum. Even though the Asian bees and glaze production disappear, the lacquer are still survive in Ningabur. Ningabur lacquer is famous and it became the largest lacquer industry in Bagan. Lacquer workshops in the village attract the tourists and the lacquer objects have a highly demand from not only tourists but also domestic pilgrims. Thus, the liquor industry has significantly contributed to the average incomes of local people with a large number engaged in its production. So, liquor ad highlights what the local identity is. As a result, Traditional knowledge and skill have been protected toward the awareness of villagers and their life, livelihood. Craftsmen, artists, and parents give training to the young generation in like a workshop, traditional color painting, and bamboo craft workshop in the annual or summer holiday. Some workshop owner give a trainee program with offering daily wages, which depend on scale level. Thus, intent project traditional handicraft and to sustain of local livelihood. The preference of young generation is to engage in lacquer like workshop and traditional color painting, but there are a few in bamboo craft Every member of families has their preference and particular talent in the engagement of different industry. Parents encourage and their children's interest as production or handicraft promote local identity. The plot the, the intangible cultural heritage and have it to be resilient in itself and in relating to other parts of the world. And some local artists have engaged in the cloudy painting. Artists paint Buddhist religious sense from the mural painting of Buddhist temple. The Buddhist Jataka, the life of Buddha in landscape or vegan sense are very popular folklore paintings with high demand.
Gen generation have shown interest in cool paintings and why? Inspired from Asian new painting, they have created innovative design and shape based on traditional way. Thus, inherited practice or traditional knowledge and skill has contributed to building this livelihood from generation to generation. Another livelihood or mingaval locus is cultivation. Although a minor sector with little engagement in traditional ways. An interview with the local artisan showed that their livelihood is threatened with numerous challenges during the pandemic. The main target of local economy is tourism. Its restriction started since 2019. It has negative impact on their livelihood of artisan and workshop owners. International demand decreased considerably and the production have stopped completely in the workshops or handicrafts distributor throughout uh, some artisans accept a modest order from domestic demand. Even to farmers receive regular income from agriculture, artisans spend their save money for their hake and daily consumption. In the case of an employee household, families with high income provide to the poor families. And at at the Buddhist monuments such as the Miyazi Distuva and like uh, Manuhar and the Baguda Trustee have open secure bank saving accounts for donations from local people and domestic pilgrim as well as online contributions. To conclude, Mingavar artisan and craftsmen have successfully sustained their livelihood by understanding traditional knowledge and skill. It is one of the active village among the Asian cities or Burma with traditional production, inherited cultivation and active Asian temples. Although Mingavar is facing difficulties and challenges, it stays surviving with incredible strength from the first millennial century to the present time. The livelihood of Mingavar support, the religious and economic life of this village, the main as aspects described in this brief paper include pagoda festivals such as papa making, offerings, and tourism with a very lacquer production, basis cultivation and bamboo products providing an essential product for housing, fencing, and containers. The livelihoods are balanced between gender and age group. This combination of factors provide a flexibility allowing chain alongside continuity in the years to come. In summary, the Mingaba community has slowly deployed strategies to respond to numerous challenges even during this pandemic time. Local artisans enhance and protect traditional knowledge and individual and community resilient. Okay, great. That's the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I appreciate welcome questions anytime. Thank you, Tian Tianang. Uh, the next uh, presentation will be the Thai carpentry knowledge transmission 
the development of traditional apprenticeship in a new context uh, will be presented by Nishamon Hiranyapluk, uh, who is a PhD student at the Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies, Waseda University. Uh, let us uh, share her presentation uh, from now on, please. Hi everyone, my name is Nisha Monhilan Prud. Today I would like to make a presentation about Thai carpentry knowledge transmission, the development of traditional apprenticeship in a new context. I'm currently a PhD student at Waseda University, and this is a part of my dissertation. So if you have any suggestion, I would appreciate it. Here's the outline of today's presentation. It will start with background and significance then follow by research question, framework and methods, findings, and then with conclusion. Um, traditional Thai wooden architecture is one of the most distinguished examples of Thailand's national heritage. Some of these traditional structures are conserved by governmental agencies, while others are protected by private owners. For instance, people who inherit the buildings from their ancestors Newly built, newly built traditional houses with adaptive space are still popular to some extent despite the spread of modern concrete houses. Um, however, one of the primary concerns in the conservation of traditional wooden structures is the shortage of highly skilled carpenters who can perform the work necessary for the building and maintaining them because the knowledge transmission rely mainly on the learning through hands-on experience with a master, which time and patience are required to perfect one's skill. But only a few people these days have such devotion. Well, despite the need to develop a new generation of carpenters, the issue has not received sufficient critical attention. Most previous study of Thai carpentry have focuses have focused on design, form, and usability, but little is known about knowledge transmission. Therefore, this study aims to fill in the gap by focusing on the development of traditional carpentry apprenticeships. The finding of study should offer important insights into the essence of learning traditional carpentry that can be utilized to propose a new method for conserving traditional knowledge. The central question for this study asks how traditional apprenticeship has developed or evolved in the modern setting, and the framework of this study was adopted from was adapted from seven characteristics of traditional Japanese approach to learning by the conquer. The scope of this study is limited to the traditional carpentry in Latinakosin period only, and the area of Carpentry is only the structural techniques. Um, it, this study does not cover the traditional woodworking for decorative purpose, such as um, yard or Chofa which is the decorative ornaments on the roof. And this study also does not cover the wood carving ornaments as well. Therefore, the term carpenter in this study refers to the structural carpenters only. The research data of this study was drawn from three main sources. The first one was the first one is the interviews with um, relevant parties, such as um, people who have like who have been involved with um, traditional Thai architecture, for example, architects who is who are working for the fine art departments under the Ministry of Culture, the master commenters. And, and construction companies specializing in the traditional architecture. The second one, the second sources are participant observation on construction site. And the last one is documentary research. Let's move on to the findings. It will be a summary of the traditional apprenticeships and the educational institutes and a company training program. Let's start with the traditional apprenticeship and the learning process. I think it's a common knowledge that um, everyone knows that apprenticeship is the main format of study. 
for any craft, and that is the same for traditional Thai carpentry as well. In general, apprentice would ask the master to take them in and train them. And by training them, um, it means that it means like allowing them to observe, imitate, and practice alongside with the master while working with him, with them. And sometimes, uh, since the, the techniques are so difficult, sometimes the master have to indulge the apprentice. And since is since the process is long and difficult, the apprentice is expected to repay the master by helping out with the chores or other tasks. Some would live in it with the master so that they can observe closely and also help out around the houses as well. And in the past, techniques were usually passed out within the family and certain family of artisans were famous for certain crafts. However, there are only a few written records describing families that has master wood joinery for construction and the apprenticeship process they use. Therefore, I gathered information from the interview with the master carpenters, which um, show that the most important process in learning is the repetitive training on the construction site. So the on-site training has is like one of the most crucial process of knowledge transmission. Um, during the or during early Latinakosin period, the king also considered it their mission to cultivate traditional traditional arts and crafts. Therefore, they order a lot of constructions, um, restoration, and repair projects to create opportunities for loyal court artisans to polish their skills and pass on the knowledge to their apprentice. Um, as for the local carpenters, the construction process also play the important role as well. When wood and other local materials were the main building materials for building the house, the local people in the community would, would help each other build their homes. And the people with specific skill like carpenters, um, painters, and stock artisans would help build the basic infrastructures in the neighborhood. Therefore, that community building is with each other kind of encouraged the knowledge sharing within the community. Now let's move on to the educational institute. Um, modernization has encourage the formal education system and traditional craft um, and arts also included in the curriculum as well. And as for the Thai traditional craft and arts were firstly in included in the formal education curriculum during the reign of the King Rama VI. The Persian school was founded in 19. 13 to conserve the traditional skills. And carpentry was originally a part of the curriculum, but unfortunately it was removed later. Um, and then later, like now today, we also have, we still have traditional Thai craft and architecture program offer in a fully hands-on learning format in the diploma and high vocational school However, most of these programs are not associated with the traditional structure, uh, with the traditional structural carpentry, but focusing more on the decorative woodworking and uh, modern carpentry. As for the university level architecture education, there are only a few universities that offer the traditional Thai architecture and the graduates from Chulalongkorn University who major in traditional Thai architecture told me that although the student in this program um, would develop a comprehensive understanding of traditional Thai wood choice for construction, but they would not be able to build the house themselves. However, they would be able to supervise the carpenters on construction site because they have the knowledge of the accurate proportion, the 
the form and structure. So in that sense, they work together on site to make the to make the building happen. Um, but both knowledge were not in the same person as of present. Um, on the contrary, the School of Architecture at the Asomsin Institute of Arts plays a strong emphasis on the hands-on learning. Apart from the lectures, um, students are required to um, work at a construction site under the supervision of their professors. However, it is unclear that the graduates of this program are able to use the traditional techniques. Um, next topic is the in-house training. The study collect data about in-house training from these two companies, um, Likit, Bawachar Likit Gangchang and Sauer Jeron. Um, because these two companies have good track record of developing new generation of carpenters, even though they have, and they also have like different approaches. So it's, it's interesting to see how different approach um, give the similar result of cultivating a new generation of carpenters in present day. And let's start with PVC Likit Gansang or Bawa Choi. Um, Bawa Choi Likit Gansang has been entrusted with a lot of loyal projects as well as the repair and restoration of nas national treasures. For, in for instance, Prameh Lumad which is a temporary construction for royal cremation ceremony of royal family members and a lot of Thai pavilion overseas, including um, two of the pavilions in Tokyo and Osaka. Um, well, PVC is, is one of a few company that can perform the traditional construction in Thailand right now and is one of the leading companies now today. And the founder of this company himself is also the master carpenter who perfect his skill through like quite traditional mode of education because he was he learned it directly from um, his master who was who were working with the fire art departments of uh, Ministry of Culture. And it is interesting to see how he could come up with the training that is have to be adapted into the modern world in, within his own construction company. Um, he told me that he trains the apprentice himself, even though he's the founder and like the owner of the company. And some of the uh, apprentice stay at his compound, which include his house and woodworking studio. Um, the apprentice, learn the basics in the studio before they start working at actual construction site where they learn more advanced skills. He noted that although the hardship of training has been elevated somewhat by modern electric tools, carpentry remains a top skill to master and he has to supervise his apprentice very closely. He also added that um, the hands-on learning remains crucial because carpentry cannot be taught through words alone, even though he has to give the advice or the instruction to his apprentices really closely. Um, let's move on to Saw Rejelun. Saw Rejelun is a well-known traditional Thai home builders with more than 40 years of experience. Their outstanding projects are, for example, Thai traditional house at Suan Pakdat Palace and Thai pavilion in Tel Aviv. So Rajalun is different from our Charlie Kit Gan Chang in many ways. Like the biggest one is that the founder of this company is not a master carpenter. She is a business woman who teach herself, who, who train herself and she also received the award like person of the year in traditional heritage conservation. So even though she doesn't have like, um, she doesn't, she didn't learn directly from the master, but she proved that the way she 
taught herself is good enough to to um, make it work and receive a award from a legitimate in, um, organization. Um, well, because of her business breakdown, like the company founder has been years taught teaching herself by observing carpenters while, while they were working on, con on traditional Thai houses. And she sometimes took measurements of the houses that she was interested in to learn more. And even though she cannot build a house by herself, she learned the knowledge such as, such as like structure, proportion, and assembly well enough to work with carpenters to set up a training system. And the carpenter, carpenters of Sauvageland are divided into four groups according to the task. Um, for example, like general carpenter, wood panel carpenter, roof ornament carpenter, and assembly carpenter. And this, this categorizing is quite interesting because in the past, like a, a, a long time ago, when we still have Grom Chang Sip Mu, which is like traditional arts department, they are also divided carpentries in small tasks like this as well. So it is interesting that she used the new technique, she used the new training system, but she also adopt some of the traditional way as well. Um, yeah, um, but the basic of the learning is quite similar to Pawashali Kikan Chang, like young carpenters are trained by the senior carpenter who possess like higher level of the skills and they will start from the baby step like the the easy part first and then move on to the more complicated techniques and despite their differences between two companies they are they, they are facing the same problem which is a lack of new carpenters um even though the wage are a little bit higher than the minimum wage of other workers, but the trainee does not have a patience to commit to commit, like they don't have the commitment to perfect that skill. And even though it's much easier, like the trainee doesn't have to request the master to take them in and they even get paid as a salary. But yeah, there's still a lot of trainees are work a lot of trainees quit and look for other job that is easier and doesn't require at least five years training. So my preliminary conclusion, um, the finding today have revealed that the format of the learning has transitioned from the living with from living with one's master and working for compensation to two main approaches. Uh, the first one is learning in formal school or undergoing, and the second one is undergoing in-house training at a company. Um, however, even though the, the approach and the structure has changed, but the essence, the essence, the essence, essence of the learning has not been affected by the format, which is the importance of the experimental experiential learning. Therefore, to conserve the traditional carpentry techniques, it is, it is important to highlight ex, ex, per, experiential learning and provide incentives for trainees to complete their studies. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please feel free to do so. And I'm also welcome to any suggestion as well. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, let's go to the Q&A session. Uh, may, okay, may I start with uh, the first uh, paper for this session. Uh, Hee-Suk Lee, uh, based on your experience, how the spirit of place uh, for the, uh, the Philippines Baroque Church is perceived by the stakeholders 
in each level of the country, uh, like for the local uh, community, for the national uh, society, or the government level, or international level, how these people perceived the uh, spirit of the place of the Baroque church. Your question is a very, very good. This is a very good question, so I will answer. <laughs> uh, the spirit of place is a very different. This is a cognitive. Depends on your background, your tradition, your memories, whether collectively, individually, it depends on your religion too. So when you see the facade, triangular facade, some people think maybe Hindu Buddhist tourists who are Hindu Buddhists in Philippines, they think this is a mountain. When uh, this uh, Spanish people, tourists come, or Spanish stakeholders see, they see this is uh, their church. Somebody think, Muslim think, this is a different way. So every, this building itself is different spirits, depending on how you perceive, how you want to perceive, how you want to perceive. So uh, if there's a message from the building in different way, the building has a spirit. So we cannot teach the stakeholder or people, please, this is a spirit of place. You must feel it. You must sense it. However, everybody can connect because they have a memory, or good memory, better memory. However, when there is a energy in there, and a sense, you feel sense, this place is spirit. So we cannot say spirit is like spirit but there's something connected with your cognitive mind and memory, this spirit. So we have to, however, we can emphasize, so that's why it is very, very important how to interpret building that we can share our feelings, meanings, not that you are correct, I'm not correct, we don't do like that, but it's a sharing, share the spirit place. Thank you. Uh, then we go to the uh, uh, Tian Tian Ang. Uh, the question from uh, Professor uh, Charlotte Galloway for you uh, Do the villagers at Mayingaba get any support to continue their traditions now they are part of the World Heritage Legion? Okay. Thank you for your question for Professor. And uh, Charlo Galloway. Yes, I, I would like to have it to answer your question. Yes, uh, you are right. The village uh, is a part of our heritage site. Um, but uh, the villagers uh, preserve their traditional knowledge by inheritor from generation to generation with a lack of attention from the outside. The villagers uh, do not get any support to continue their traditional craft. Uh, especially during a uh, pandemic, uh, they are struggling with many challenges. But um, like her, yes, uh, like her industry, stay near to get attention from uh, from support of NGO. If NGO can support to achieve a sustainable diploma, we look at traditional identity and promote to reach international market or something. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Another question in relation to uh, Ang Ang Tin's presentation. Uh, since the material used uh, in both uh, lacquerware and uh, for conservation, uh, like bamboo or lacquer are natural, are there any measures to conserve the natural areas of uh, this kind of material in order to ensure the sufficiency of these materials in the future? Yes, um, the villagers use the, mater uh, the material uh, is the natural, natural resource. Yeah, and the, the natural resource uh, for in the production of lake are very expensive and they import uh, from outside Obama. So um, the villagers cannot uh, um, how to invest uh, the natural resource uh, in in Mingaba village. So it's uh, very difficult to get uh, 
the natural uh, uh, for especially in the natural pigment natural pigment are not uh, uh, are not get uh, from uh, local the local area so it's how to say yeah <laughs> Yeah. So some uh, you mean like uh, the materials used uh, now now so they in Mayingaba uh, uh, come from yeah, the other the area, area, right? Yeah, yes, the other area as well. even the bamboo is from other area from upper part of Amar. Yeah, but it's from the natural areas. It's still natural materials. Yeah. Uh, yes, it is natural uh, material. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank uh, you. So for, uh, the question for Nishmon. Uh, what do you think about the uh, uh, wood substitute composite material to be used for uh, the real uh, timber in terms of the uh, carpentry uh, knowledge, education, or transmission well i think it's possible and i think it's a good idea to use some type of substitute material because as long as the knowledge has been passing on to the next generation regardless to the material that is being uh is adapted to use then i think it's okay to adapt according to the current problem like wood is has becoming like really expensive and hard to find and even so only the rich or someone who have privilege can access to that kind of material. So I think in, in order to make it sustainable preservation, um, any material can be considered to be used in this kind of traditional building. However, we have to be careful about um, like what is the really, what is the main, um, the, the main concept of the, the, the knowledge. For example, if we use the new material and we have to adapt or we have to um, give up some sort of the technique, then that might not be a good option. But as long as we can carry on the tradition well, then I think the material can be anything else. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I agree that uh, uh, even we can find some materials to use for wood, but uh, if we need to change the uh, technique from the traditional techniques that we normally use uh, for wood, uh, it won't be possible to continue the traditional uh, techniques for the carpentry, for the Thai architecture. And also this is another thing that when we're talking about the uh, conservation in terms of material, the, uh, the resources is very important. So we not only uh, be able to preserve or conserve the material or the, the techniques itself, but we also need to think about the resources of those materials used in the traditional techniques as well. Okay, so uh, I have the uh, last question for uh, three uh, of you. It's from uh, Neil Ryan to all the speakers. Uh, actually, today and in the past couple of days, which perhaps impossible for the past couple of days, but for today, I think it's fine. Uh, Okay, he, he just said we, uh, he would like to send his sincere thanks to our really informative presentation uh, and greeting from Pinang. I think that's, that's his comment. So I think congratulations for uh, everyone here and uh, for the uh, presenters for the past few days as well. Okay, so I think uh, any more May I questions? Have one comment? May I have one comment? Uh, Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We are. I have a listening from the two speakers. We must be a little bit careful to use the term traditional. Traditional means what is traditional from which epoch, which epoch? Because we have to know very clear what it means traditional. And of course, if we are changing the material. Of course, intangible part we don't talk so much about, but what the heritage part, we talk very much authenticity. So we must be a little bit uh, considering when we use this term traditional. Okay, thank you. I think this is also uh, 
like uh, the issues that we have been discussed until today, <laughs> when we talk about the uh, traditional knowledge and uh, also some uh, perception and understanding about these terms, because for some people it can be like a, a give a kind of misleading to the understanding of these terms, right? Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so before we uh, end our session for today, may I uh, inform that tomorrow we will start uh, at 10 uh, a.m. Bangkok time uh, as today uh, for uh, our fourth day of SPAFACON. And uh, thank you very much, uh, all presenters, and also our uh, audience who are uh, watching us from our Facebook Live and also who are with us until this minute in our webinar. And uh, see you again tomorrow.